Welcome to Sportsbeat KC, the Kansas City Stars daily sports podcast. It's Wednesday, February 24th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. Last night, all three of our major college programs were in action, all tipped off at 8 p.m. Only one came away victorious. It wasn't Kansas, with revenge on its mind at Texas. It wasn't Missouri, favored at home over Ole Miss. It was Kansas State knocking off number seven Oklahoma at Bramlage Coliseum. And we start today's show talking about the Wildcats and their star from the game, Mike McGurl. We'll pick it up with KU and beat writers Jesse Newell and Gary Bedore. And then we'll hear from Missouri Athletic Director Jim Sterk, who met with reporters before the Tigers' loss. Sterk covered several topics, but we'll share what he said about basketball and men's basketball coach Conzo Martin. So let's get started talking K-State with Kellis Robinette. Kellis Robinette is here, and my first question to you, Kellis, is why can't Lon Kruger win at Bramlage Coliseum? What is it about his old stomping grounds that prevents him from winning there? It doesn't matter what team he brings to Kansas State. The man cannot win at his old stomping grounds. It, it is one of the more unbelievable things I've ever witnessed. Um, he's 0-9 in his last nine trips here. He has actually won here once. And the funny thing about all this is that his very first team at Oklahoma, which was very bad, I believe they finished last in the Big 12, swept Kansas State when Frank Martin was coach, beat him here. Kansas State was ranked. It was like this, like, oh, no, Kruger's going to come in and dominate K-State kind of moment. And then Bruce Weber has come in and beaten him nine straight with, uh, and it's kind of unbelievable how lopsided some of these games looked on paper coming in. Um, last night, Oklahoma was set, was number seven in the country. K State had six wins total and still won. Oklahoma's previously lost here with the number one ranked team, the number four ranked team, the number 23 ranked team. It, it's almost like they're lacing uh, the visiting bench with kryptonite or something. I don't know what it is. His teams just wilt every time they come here. It's it is amazing. Buddy Heald couldn't win in Bramwich. Trey Young couldn't win in Bramwich. You know, some of the best players in college basketball over the last uh, decade have not been able to win at Kansas State. Yeah, Austin Reeves can't do it. They were letting him get, get away with every push <laughs> off imaginable last night too. Heck of a win for Kansas State and. Um, Bit of a you know, bit of a streak here for the Wildcats playing much better basketball here of late. What's well, look, let's let's not belabor the obvious here. Mike McGurl had the game of his career. Uh, at, at least let's let's frame it this way. In in he's had great games in, in a Kansas State uniform. He's had big moments and big contributions to big wins for Kansas State. But I just thought from a just from an individual take over a game at the end standpoint that was his best moment you agree I, yes I agree wholeheartedly um this was the first time like he was the guy doing it um the two other big games that come to mind was he scored 17 points you and I were both there uh, when Kansas State beat Creighton in the first round of the NCAA tournament that was unexpected but you know they had Barry Brown they had Kamal Stokes it was basically just a bonus um they might have even won without it I'm not sure um, a few years later, he helped uh, Barry Brown beat West Virginia with the biggest comeback in school history, scored 18 points. Great, great moment. Everybody remembers it. But again, that was, you know, more of a Barry Brown thing than him. Last night, this was him. And he really saved the day because with four minutes to go, Oklahoma was up six. They were in the double bonus. Kansas State had made four of 23 three-pointers all day long. They've been a bad three-point shooting team all year. There was no reason to expect that all of a sudden someone would come out and start draining threes. Then he comes down and goes bang, 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 nine points on three shots. Um, totally changed the game, put them ahead. They never trailed again. And, um, yeah, so somebody asked him afterward, was this your best moment? Did it top those others? He wouldn't go there, but I'll go there. This was his best, I, I think, uh, no doubt. For sure. And, look, it, it comes at a time when, yeah, the, the Wildcats had beaten TCU to end the, to end the losing streak and uh, recently. Uh, but – I don't. I don't know if we. I guess. You look, you cover him. You see him every game. You, you you've seen him play better. I'm not sure anybody was convinced that you know a corner had been turned or you know this was a team that that uh, that that was capable of beating the number what seven ranked team in the country. But um, but it happened. And so I, I guess my question is, 
how much better is this Kansas State team now than than it was just uh, you know three weeks ago? Uh, they're they're quite a bit better, and the biggest difference is has been defense. Um, they've held. I mean, it, it's not just like you know make believe they're slowing the game down. Teams are still scoring on them. They're actually getting stops now. They've they've held four straight teams um, at or below zero point nine four points per possession. And typically anything below one point possession is considered pretty good in basketball. So to do that four straight games against teams like Oklahoma State, Kansas, TCU, and Oklahoma, Oklahoma is one of the better scoring teams in the country. So especially to do it against them, that shows how far they've come. And um, it, the surprising thing about it is that earlier in the season, this was looking like by far. When I say by far, I mean like um, no comparison that this was the worst defense Bruce Weber has ever had at Kansas State. They had a game against Baylor where they allowed 1.47 points per possession, um, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's almost <laughs> like they weren't even out there. Baylor could have done that against Ayer. They scored over 100 points in both meetings against the Bears. So that that was bad. Um, there were certainly – I mean, they started the season. They gave up 80 against Drake. Uh, just just a lot of bad performances in there. But, but somewhere along the lines, they got some continuity – um, I don't know, a few games ago, Bruce Weber said he wanted to see the guys start slapping the floor, which I think is a bit obnoxious, but that's kind of served as their turning point. They've played a lot better since then. And, <laughs> you know, the offense is still lagging behind, but hey, when they can hit some clutch shots like they had the last two games, you can see it's just enough for them to win occasionally. A floor slapping turnaround. I like it. I like it. So, all right. So where do they go from here, Kellis? It's slaptastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, low-hanging fruit there, Kellis. <laughs> um, you know, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, I don't certainly don't love their chances against West Virginia. Um, they were without Antonio Gordon last night, which made the upset even more improbable. I don't know that he'll be back at full strength, and they never play good in Morgantown. I, I mean, if they win that one, then, boy, they're really on a roll here. That's what they call a winning streak, three straight uh, victories. Um, but they caught it. They caught a nice break to end the season. They'll get Iowa State here after Iowa State has to play four games in eight days. So you would certainly think that is a winnable game for them. And then, you know, who knows? They go to the Big 12 tournament with some momentum. Maybe they've won three or four or four and four. They get another win there. And all of a sudden, you know, as bad as the season looked at times, maybe uh, it can end on a decent enough note. They can maybe approach 10 wins or something like that. Um and, you know, that this whole season really, I mean, they were picked to finish last from the get-go. I don't know that anybody was realistically thinking they'd make any kind of tournament, whether it be the NCAA, the NIT, or one of those CBI type of things. It was really more about, um, you know, establishing a foundation, building something for the future, and uh, hopefully winning, winning next year and beyond with this young core. And finally, I think you're at least starting to see it's possible um, with these last two games. So yeah, they'll they'll go to Kansas City to defend their co Big Twelve tournament championship uh, from from last year. Uh, so. <laughs> All right, Kellis, uh, great catching up with you, and we will we'll talk to you again soon. Jesse Newell and Gary Bedore here. You guys covered last night's Kansas Texas game. The Jayhawks lose it seventy five seventy two in overtime. I was interested in Bill Self's post game uh, comments. He as as you you would expect him to be a little ticked at the loss, um, but but he sounded more constructive than anything, Jesse. I, I thought he, you know, pointed out the areas where they where they failed down the stretch, and thought they were correctable and teachable. And you know, of course, you you can't you can never um, you know you can't hide the disappointment in, in his in his tone when they lose a game like this, especially one after they they led by eleven. But I, I just thought. He was more. These are things we can fix, and let's uh, let's let's put this one in the rearview mirror pretty quickly. Yeah, it's it's the waves of Bill Self here because I think we've talked about this multiple weeks on the on this podcast, which is like at first it was like look big picture, you know, think about how you can be good for the NCAA tournament, which is what's important because they're not going to win the Big Twelve, and then it was like. I desperately want to take second place in the big 12 <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that message from him, you know, and Bill Self really wanted to do that and got competitive again. And then last night it was like, and Gary can talk a little bit about this. There was even like a twinge, a tinge of, 
I'm really mad that Baylor isn't playing all these games. So uh, this Big 12 seeding in the Big 12 tournament doesn't really matter. So I don't really care about that anymore. So, yeah, it has kind of gone in a little bit of waves here where Bill Self has gone from ultra competitive, have to win every game, Bill Self, to ah, I just didn't want the team to get better, Bill Self, to like, well, the you know, the team lost, but it's not that big of a deal, Bill Self. So it, it has been a different message over time. But, you know, um, <laughs> it's more of an NBA mindset to me. You know, it's sometimes shots go in. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you get a call that goes your way. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes the other team shoots a lot of free throws. Sometimes they don't. KU left a lot of controllables on the board yesterday in their game and had a a lot of different ways where they could have won the game with one particular play and didn't get it done. So usually that frustrates Bill Self. But uh, I wrote about kind of this in in what I, in my analysis after the game, which is it's it's not going to be a big deal game. You know, like KU sort of a four or five seed in the NCAA tournament. They're not going to miss the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, it could have been a good resume win, but now they've got Baylor, and within two weeks, everybody will be forgetting about this one anyway. So, KU okay, wasn't going to win the Big 12. This wasn't going to determine that. So, I think he's sort of right to look big picture, but it has been inconsistent with his other messaging. And we know Bill Self, at his core, wants to win every single game that he had, takes part in, and that didn't happen for KU last night. So, Gary, what, what went right for KU in the first half? And then we'll get into what went wrong down down the, in the second half, and then especially down the stretch. Well, Bryce Thompson scored eleven the first half, so that was eleven. They didn't get in the second half because he didn't get any. He only played about five minutes the second half, I believe. Um, but they reverted back. Self said that at one point to when they looked terrible offensively because they only got 23 the second half, which is right in there with some of the horrible halves they've had lately. 43 the first half. Um, What got me was, well, McCormack only played three minutes the first half. So it was a real strange game in a lot of ways because they scored all those points without him. Then late in the game he fouled out with a minute and a half left and they didn't score again KU so Ochai uh, like Jesse said turned on that one shot and missed two shots and Jalen Wilson went storming in for a layup and I don't know if Kai Jones would have challenged it or not but uh, Jalen Wilson knocked it out of bounds so it was a weird game, but I'm not sure exactly in answer to your question why they were so terrible the second half, except for Bryce Thompson not being in to score 11. <laughs> yeah, look, Bryce Thompson, what a, what a first half for him, and and uh, Harris played well also in the in the first half when they when they went small against Texas. You know, Jesse, I it seemed to me that when listening to self after the game, it was. You know, look, players are going to make mistakes, right? Um, McCormick missed the dunk. Um, J- Jalen Wilson fumbled the ball out of bounds at the end when he go in. It looked like Texas was giving him the tie. They were going to go into a second overtime, and or at least you know get the ball back with six seconds to go. But but Wilson fumbles out of bounds. It was passing up the three, right? That that seemed to uh, perturb self more than that. Both with uh, with Abaji and uh, and and uh, Christian Christian Brown. Yeah, I mean, if you hear Bill Self, it's controlling the controllables, you know, like even some of the weird things that happened in the second half of that game, like Dave McCormick having an uncontested dunk and just flubbing it, you know, like you can yell at David if you want, but like he's not trying to miss the dunk. It's just something that happens. And Ojai Abaji had a wide open three with about a minute left in overtime, shot a shot he should shoot every single time and missed it. You're not going to get mad at that because sometimes shots go in, sometimes don't. they don't, but yeah, I think the thing that he was flustered with most was Christian Brown and, and Ochai Abaji turning down shots. And, and we've sort of talked about this throughout the entire year with those two guys. And and when I talk about, you know, hey, having an NBA mindset that Bill Self, um, you know, has basically had at, at times this year, uh, that's part of it, which is for this Kansas team that's going to struggle offensively, you know, in the NBA, when Steph Curry gets an open three, it doesn't matter if he's 0 for 5. It doesn't matter if he's 1 for 11. He shoots the shot because that's, That's the Warriors' best way of scoring. That's their most efficient play. And so when Christian Brown and Ochai Abaji pass those up, up fake, then drive into the lane, they're playing against their own strengths, 
And both of them are really good at spot up threes or Christian Brown's pretty good at threes off the dribble as well. And they're turning those down for less efficient shots. And I think that one play with Abaji was really telling because, you know, Gary can talk to this too. You know, I don't think we've seen him all year make that play or try to make that play. You know, either he shoots it or he takes a dribble or two and passes it back out, but he never tries to go create his own shot off the dribble. It's just, it's not the player who he is. And, and, you know, you don't want to tell guys don't do this, but you want to tell them, Hey, play to your strength, play to what you do best. And so that those guys turn down those shots along with just the execution late. It was really fascinating on the post game radio. What Bill Self talked about at the end of regulation, KU was down two and self calls timeout. They draw up a play ends up Marcus Garrett throws off the backboard and misses Dave McCormick gets the rebound and puts it back in. And uh, Bill Self has asked that about that play on the radio afterwards by Greg Gurley. He says, I wanted to shoot a three. The play was to shoot a three in that instance. And KU just completely forgot what they were doing, uh, evidently, uh, in that particular moment. I tried to watch the replay. It's really confusing. I don't know what was supposed to happen. I, I'm guessing Marcus Garrett was supposed to use a ball screen instead of rejecting it. And that kind of threw everything off. But um, Bill Self had commented that three different times out of timeouts, KU just players just forgot what they were doing. And so that's what's going to eat at him because that is how Bill Self has always won close games with his teams. They, I mean, if you go back to the replay, uh, the guys were talking about it. Bob was fusion and, and Jay Bills were talking about it right before that KU play. They said, KU was so good executing here. You know, they're going to get what they want. You know, they're going to get the basket and it ends up Marcus Garrett's flailing something off the backboard because nobody's doing anything that Bill Self told him to do. So those are the things that's going to drive him nuts. And again, as you mentioned before, Blair, those are the correctable things. And not only that, this is kind of the game you want to lose by having those things not happen because it reiterates that those things are important, but it gives you a loss that really isn't that huge in the grand scheme of things. The big loss is going to come in a few weeks. Right. Right. So Gary, um, what's coming up for KU? Uh, there's a, um, there, there is going to be a senior night. I guess all programs are going to go through a senior night, even though, you know, the, the status of senior players is uncertain because everybody's granted all the, you know, there's an an additional year of eligibility available to them, but what do we got coming up for Kansas? Well, uh, they play Baylor on Saturday at seven. Uh, Baylor is still undefeated, obviously. So it's a pretty big game uh, because KU's never lost on senior night. Um, I don't know if they'll make a big deal out of it and give speeches and all that, but it'll be kind of weird them talking to the cutouts. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure they would like to to gain revenge like they did last night uh, because Texas became just the second team to sweep KU in a regular season home and home during the self era. Baylor could be the third. Okie State did it in 2017-18. They won in Lawrence and Stillwater. So, uh, you know, whenever you play Baylor in this day and age now, the last couple of years, it's a big game. They're really, really good. Yeah, but got a scare last night by Iowa State. Of course, that was Baylor's first game in, in a few weeks. So, um, we'll we'll see how Baylor responds to that. Any Any guesses on what – on what these the Kansas seniors, including Marcus Garrett, are thinking uh, in terms of uh, their future. I know there's discussions have to be made now between player and coach, and um, some of them are going to be uncomfortable discussions, I suspect. But uh, do you have any inkling on what, what Kansas seniors might be thinking when it comes to either returning next year or not, Gary? No, I haven't heard much um, on that yet. Uh, Bill Self, Bill Self did – talk a little bit about on the radio last night um but he didn't he just basically said he had to have conversations with guys um about what they're going to do and uh it's it's sort of funny gary's bringing that up too because self had mentioned potentially they could try to squeeze in a game next week uh you know just to kind of fill that weekend since they got all their games in and it would be sort of funny to announce that game like today or tomorrow to make sure that that is your senior night instead of (laughs) the Baylor game to try to keep that this whole streak going. So uh, potentially, you know, Kansas might, Oh no, no, no. Baylor is not senior night. (laughs) Tarleton state is senior night. Everyone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Make the cardboard cutouts very happy. Um, But, but no, it, and this is a good question. Uh, You know, 
there's been kind of some some whispers on these ESPN broadcasts from people that obviously you know have talked to self. I, I would think Marcus Garrett's going to try to go pro, just you know, see where it takes him, and he's probably done all he will do in at Kansas. And you know, there's been talk about you know, K potentially landing some sort of transfer point guard to to fill out their roster next year. So I would assume he's gone. And I mean, same thing for Mitch Lightfoot. Uh, at some point, you know, you all start the rest of your life. You know, and this is his fifth year coming back for a sixth would be. I mean, it would make him a fan favorite, but at some point, you know, you probably just don't want to be 25 years old playing six minutes a game for Kansas just because, um, you know, think you, you want to move on. You want to go get a job. You want to start your, your life in the real world. So we'll see what happens again. If, if they come back, I'm sure Katie would welcome them, but uh, those are the two seniors and those are the ones with decisions to make. All right. Okay. Hey, uh, good conversation. Thanks Gary and Jesse. And we'll talk to you again next week. Let's switch focus to Missouri. Like I said, the Tigers are coming off a crushing loss to Ole Miss at home. Why was it crushing? The Rebels swept the season series against Mizzou. See, the Tigers have beaten Illinois, Alabama, Tennessee, and have other impressive victories. They just don't match up well against Ole Miss. The Rebels' zone defense was a factor in getting Missouri shooters out of rhythm. And when the game was tied with about 245 remaining, Ole Miss made more plays down the stretch. Missouri's spot in the NCAA tournament is secure, so no worries there. But that would have been a great victory for the Tigers last night. They just couldn't secure it. The next scheduled game is Saturday in Columbia against Texas A&M. We'll see if that one gets played. Because of COVID issues, the Aggies haven't played a game since a January 30th victory over Kansas State. Their last seven games have been postponed. Before the Ole Miss game, Athletic Director Jim Sterk met with reporters. Here's what he had to say about basketball and his response to a question about Conzo Martin's future as the Tigers coach. Martin is in the fourth of a seven-year deal, and Sterk suggests this is about the time you start thinking contract extension. Obviously, men and women's basketball regular season is closing in on the tournament time, and I, I think you know women's basketball is peaking at the right time. Um, they're, they're a tough team to to beat and they miss really miss that first part of the season the non-conference part and and they're starting to gel and I I expect them to cause some havoc in in the SEC tournament and and if they don't make it to the NCAAs that they'll they'll be in postseason with the WNIT Um, men's basketball obviously a great resume and what what coach has done is it's really the the turnaround of our program from when he came four years ago is significant and and I think we're 11 weeks in, in as far as being a top 25 team. So uh, just consistency through the through the year, which you would expect with the season, are the seniors that are involved and in getting Jeremiah back after uh, after he he was out uh, due to a death in his family. Uh, I think just has rejuvenated them, and they're uh, I look for a great great game tonight. It, it's it's that time in the contract where you start to look at it and okay, Conzo, what's important to you? Let's let's talk and. And he wants to be be here. He's building a program. He wants to be the last team standing sometime, and I think he has a great opportunity to do that here. And we want him to do that. So um, we're excited about the future under his leadership. That's going to do it for today. Thanks to our Sportsbeat KC production staff of Derek Donovan, Beth Welsh, Monty Davis, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. A tip of the cap to Callis Robinette, Jesse Newell and Gary Bedore for stopping by and talking college basketball. Links to their stories and my coverage of Missouri's loss to Ole Miss last night can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, we have another deal for you. For a limited time, you can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. After three months, it auto renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. And what a time to subscribe. The Royals are at spring training. March Madness is right around the corner, and it's never not Chief season. How do you get it? You go to kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. That's kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. Do you want more than just sports coverage? Check out the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports, news, features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented teammates, plus additional news, sports and business coverage with the e-edition a lot of good national stuff in the e-edition the details for all of these deals can be found at account dot 
kansascity.com slash subscribe. And if you're having trouble hunting down any of these offers, you just send me an email, bkirkoff at kcstar.com, and I will get you to the right place. So whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports Beat KC. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back on Thursday with another episode.